and honeybees. Um, if uh, you missed uh, at least one session, and I know Janessa missed uh, two sessions, I think. Yeah. So um, I'll send you some dates and times out, and you can tell me what, what for half hour zooms, and you can tell me what's if you want to do that, or if you want to go back and look at the recorded ones that Alexis has, um, whatever. I, re, my purpose here is so that you can be good beekeepers and uh, whatever it takes for me to do that, I'll do it. Awesome, thanks. So uh, we talked about, you know, the different types of queens, Italians, Carnolians, Caucasians, Russians. Italians and Carnolians are probably the two most popular today in the United States. Uh, if you have a choice, I'd go with Carnolian over Italian. Uh, Italian queens are very pretty. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're the best coloration of any bees. Uh, and they're very prolific though. They, they lay eggs, whether it's hot or whether it's cold, whether it's wet, whether it's dry. Um, so it, it takes more attention for them because their hives grow really fast. Um, and then Socatras is really coming up strong. They're, uh, they were bred up in Canada and they're sold through Olivez out in California. But for now, for the last three years, I've been unable to get them until like July because they're, they're always sold out uh, for small bee beekeepers. Uh, who's coming in? Oh, good. Angela's coming in. Hi, Angela. Are you on yet, Angela? Hi, here I am. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna send you my email again uh, on chat. If you would send me yours in a text message, I would appreciate it. Sure, great. Okay. Um, again, there's different types of, of what, what they breed the queens for. Um, and this is where we're, we're getting a really good pictures of what you need to look for when you do an inspection. Egg is straight up, means the queen has been and visited that cell within the last day and laid an egg right there. Uh, after three days, that egg has, uh, has bent over and is starting to become a larva and they start putting uh, this white glazy bee food on it. It's called uh, worker jelly. Uh, the nurse bees make it up. And as the larva grows, they put more and more food in, as you can see here over on the right. And they fill that cell up and that larva eats that food as fast as it can because it's growing really rapidly. And then uh, after 21 days, uh, a worker bee emerges, 24 for a drum, for a drum 16 for a queen. All right. Uh, the queen's role is just to lay eggs. She doesn't run the hive. The hive is run by the worker bees in, a, in sort of a democratic fashion. They do it by its smell. Remember, it's dark in there and there's no light. Uh, so they do it by feel and by smell. And they, they, they can tell uh, how the queen's doing by her pheromones, uh, by how much larva and uh, larva has a particular a brood smell, pheromone it gives off. And if they don't have those, they know there's a problem. Um, All right, uh, the queen mates on the, goes on one mating flight, uh, has eight to 15 matings, and she carries that sperm in her spermatheca, and she can carry it and keep it viable for up to two years, two plus years, if she lives that long. So when she lays an egg, the worker bees have, have size, the size of the cell, and the size of the cell determines whether it's going to be a drone or if it's going to be a, a worker bee. 
and then she, if it's going to be a worker bee, she fertilizes it. If it's going to be a drone, she doesn't, and then it has the same DNA uh, as, as she has. And a good queen can lay uh, in the best part of the season, 3,000 eggs a day. She can lay her body weight every day in eggs. So that's why she has a, a retinue of worker bees that just take care of her. Nurse bees that just take care of the queen. And there she is. This is a marked one. You're going to get queens, get them marked. Uh, or learn to mark them yourselves. It's, I don't mark them, I buy them marked. Or my wife marks them. What do you mark them with? Well, there's an actual uh, marking pen that you can buy for bees. Oh. Uh, and you notice it's right in, up on the top of her back there. Yeah. Uh, and that's the only place you can mark her. Because uh, remember, her breathing tubes are on the side of her abdomen. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to hurt a leg or a wing. Um, the way people get trained to mark bees is you mark uh, like 25 drones 25 times and you're getting pretty good at it. <laughs> and, you, then you, and then you mark, drones don't sting, right? Then you mark worker bees and they sting. So you have to have perfected your technique much better so you don't get stung in the fingers. And then you're ready to mark some queens uh, because they do move around and you don't want to damage them. Um, they also have a device um, that looks like, wow. They used to have these pop-ups uh, that have ice cream or frozen frozen ice in them and they pop up through a, through a tube and they have a stick on them. Um, it sort of looks like that. What happens is you can capture your queen, you could put her in this tube and very gently this thing with a foam end on it will push her up to the top and at the top there's a big screen and then mm -hmm. you can mark her through the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, they sell those obviously. Um, but do get your queens marked. You usually have a choice. Uh, it costs three to five dollars, which is a rip for the time. It somebody who's good can do a lot of queens really quick. But um, it's when you're looking for her in the hive, it helps. Worker bees live 45 days in the summer, and that that's maximum. If they have any type of disease or mite problems, they'll live less. Uh, winter bees last four or five months. <clears throat> I said the drones in the hive imitate life because the drones do absolutely nothing in the hive. They <laughs> don't do any work whatsoever. Uh, the worker bees have different tasks depending on their age. You know, new ones, uh, new newly emerged worker bees uh, clean. Then they become feeders. Their, uh, fair no their glands work after a few days and they can produce the right secretions to feed, uh, to make to make food for the workers, for um, for the not for the foragers, but for the older, almost forager bees. Uh, they feed the lung, you know, the larva with the worker jelly. They'll make royal jelly, which is slightly different, has higher protein content than the worker jelly. Uh, they, they take care of the queen, they perform undertaker duties, uh, they transport nectar when the forager comes back. They, their foragers never put nectar into a cell. It's always a transport bee that does that. And then when they get to be about 18 days old, they go on guard duty for a few days. Uh, and then eventually they become foragers for a couple weeks before they die. Um, that is important because you can see the demographics of a hive are important to how that hive works together. Now, an older bee can feed younger bee, can become a feeder or a cleaner. It's just that they aren't very efficient at it. They're, um, for like feeding, they have to develop secretions from their glands. And an older bee, those glands will have shrunken and not be very efficient. Whereas a younger bee, they're very big and they're very efficient. Uh, so bees can regress in their tasks, but it doesn't do the hive much 
it isn't efficient for the hive. Uh, DCA is like a bar for, for drones. <laughs> it's a drone congregation area, and this is a great story you can tell your girlfriends, I guess. Um, the only purpose of a drone is to mate with virgin queens. They perform no work in the hive. They're fed for the first 12 days by worker bees, and then they usually just feed on honey after that. Uh, they fly several uh, mating flights each day from like, I don't know, 10 to 3 or 10 to 4. Usually that drone congregation area is about, say, 2 miles from the, from the hive. Now, the interesting part about this is there will be 10,000, 15, 20,000 drones in that, in that drone congregation area. They come from all over, and they, they sort of magically meet at a spot that they know is a good spot for a, a virgin queen to fly through. Um, like I see, typically it's like an average of 100 feet above the ground. Um, interesting part is they never mate with, with, I won't say never, but almost never mate with a queen from their own hive because queens from their own hive pre prevent incestuous relationships because they have the same DNA as a drone, always fly at least three to four miles away from the hive to find a drone congregation area. So by nature, they're separating where they're mating from where their drones are waiting to be mated. It's, it's interesting. How do, know, how do we never, I like not see this ever? Like I've never seen a drone congregation. <laughs> well, guess what? University students track these. They take pictures of them. You can find them uh, if, you, if you pay attention and uh, are really observant and really look to see where drones are flying wow. and then you go out and they're about 100 feet in the air typically in a clearing but close to a uh, wood i would say to a timber area or, or some area but there'll be a, a and there's great pictures of these with a with a queen flying through it looks like a tornado on its side because there's Mm -hmm. The fast ones are obviously up front, and then there's a, uh, a cloud of bees, a cloud of drones chasing that poor queen, and it's sort of dark. It's, it's interesting pictures that they take. You had a question? Ha have you ever found one? No, but I've never looked. Uh, I've seen pictures, and that sort of appeased me. <laughs> I mean, so this, is different um, than a, this wouldn't be the same thing as a swarm? No, no, not a, not no, not the same as a swarm. A swarm is when your hive leaves. These are just drones, like 10, 15, 20,000 drones waiting in an area for a virgin queen to fly through. She flies through and they want to mate with her while she's flying at about 12, 15 miles an hour. So they chase her. So the fast ones win. Uh, it's amazing pictures. Just and don't they fly, don't they die as soon as they mate? Like yeah, the, as, soon as, as soon as they mate, and they die. Uh, she removes. Uh, <laughs> it usually comes off when they die. Yeah. Uh, and then the next one will will mate, and she never stops. She keeps flying. Uh, and Crazy. It's pretty amazing. Um, and she only does one flight typically, uh, for the most part. If she doesn't, if there's bad weather, if you have, the reason this is all important is if there's bad weather and you have an unmated queen in your hive, she won't fly, right? And after about a week uh, of not flying, if there's really a bad stretch of weather, uh, she'll never be mated properly. So you, she'll be a queen that will only lay drones, uh, drone eggs. Um. Uh, and I've had that happen once. Um, yeah. And the the bees accept her because she's giving out the pheromones. She's laying eggs. And there's the right larva smell in the in the hive, but everything's a drone. Mm -hmm. okay. So here's here's the anatomy of a bee, and the reason this one is here is you see these little spots on the worker bee's side. These are breathing tubes. They're called spiracles. Um, so when you mark a bee or if they're in water or if they get covered with mud, they cover these spiracles and then they suffocate. 
that's the only, mm. only way they breed. Uh, the other interesting thing is there is a mite, a specific mite, that uh, that isn't a huge problem anymore, but used to be uh, 20 years ago, that would lay its eggs in the spherical's and suffocate, eventually the bee would suffocate because all the eggs, all the spherical's would be full of eggs. Uh, the mite today is a varroa mite, which is the problem. Um, and that's the top of the bee with the three ocelli, uh, which are uh, eyes, and the two compound eyes. And then this is the uh, front leg. You see it says the pollen brush. She can use that to brush off her antenna and her front legs. Um, and she moves, or I, I'm sorry, that's the antenna cleaner on the front. And in the back, there's this uh, pollen press right here. And she sticks the pollen in here, and she can keep compressing it until you see that little bulb of, of hard pollen that they can compress in the back, on the back leg. When you inspect a hive, you want to see if they're bringing pollen back in, because if they are, uh, they probably have larvae in there, because that's, uh, that's about the only reason they bring pollen back is because because they have larvae and they have to feed larvae or they have to feed the queen. So it's a good indicator. I have uh, this internal anatomy of a bee because it's just uh, interesting their heart. And their heart's a five stage heart. And this red line here, you see, is, is this is the heart right here. This is a five stage heart. It just pumps blood and it, there's no veins. It just pushes it out, and the blood permeates through the rest of the cells in her body. Mm. Uh, and the other reason I had this here is you see the pink tube and the pink stomach. Um, this is the uh, uh, how she siphons up the nectar right here and then it goes into this tube into her honey stomach and it's a honey stomach there's a valve here to the rest of her stomach but this is where uh the nectar goes it's called a honey stomach and obviously it mixes with her enzymes in the stomach when she comes back to the hive and she transfers it transfers the nectar to a transport bee she regurgitates that nectar out to the transport bee, usually there's only one transport bee, but on occasion there'll be two, moving it to a cell. When they get that nectar to a cell, they move it and they siphon it in and out of that cell and buzz their wings to dehydrate it from, I don't know, what was it, 70% water down to 17%. So they're very busy. This so, is a Go ahead. So, so really, I mean, like I've joked with my kids before that you're eating like basically be puke is what honey is yeah, yeah it's called. So is, it, is it literally go from one bee to another bee and then in the hive so it's actually been like spit up twice yes almost yeah always the, the the forager bee never takes it to a cell they always give it to a transport bee which yeah. is the younger bee different enzymes right and they mm -hmm. transport it to a cell and then put it in and suck it back out, put it back in several mm. times while they're vibrating their wings, trying to dehydrate it. That's how you get the enzymes in the in the honey. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was at a school last year teaching this, and you know, I I was working around it because I didn't want to sensitize the kids, and the kids are going bee vomit, bee vomit. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I guess you already know. <laughs> Uh, and this is relatively sized. So you see the queen here on the left, the male drone with the big eyes, and then the worker bee. And of course, if you're going to mate with the queen at 12 miles an hour, uh, you need big eyes to be accurate. <laughs> what can I say? So now that's why I have this picture here, because you'll see all these bees. They'll pull out a frame, and there'll be bees everywhere, and they're all moving around. Um, and the only clue 
you have is if they got big eyes like this one here, it's a drone. Other than that, they're worker bees. You don't know if they're nurse bees or foragers or what, uh, but you can see, look at the difference in eyes between this worker bee and that drone. It's just huge. I think I have more pictures too on the drone. So there's the Mark Queen again with her retinue. Here's the worker bee. And down here is good honey. You see, when they first encapsulate honey, it'll have this very white, nice um, wax on it. They walk over it, and eventually that wax gets brown from, from them walking on it, is what happens. And you can see the honey in the, in the little cells here. Uh, okay, so you're going you're gonna to have a location of where you're going to put your your hives up. And then remember, we're talking about we we talked about what the queen does and how to look for her, and what the demographics of the hive are, why you need demographics because they all have different jobs to do. Um, a lot of it is where you're going to put your hive. Um, this is a, a perfect picture of hive location. And I I never heard of a dapple sunlight until, until I started looking at these. But there's such a thing called dapple sunlight. And um, if you have a woods with very few trees, but it's, it's very clear and there's some shade, that's considered dapple sunlight. Um, this is a perfect location. You know, there's a water source, there's drainage, there's wind breaks, um, but bees aren't, bees will work for you almost anywhere. This is the bee, um, the bird bath issue. They're all drinking and this will happen all the time in the summer. Uh, um, at the oddest hours, sometimes there won't be any bees and then there'll be tons of bees. Uh, and I can tell you in July and August when it gets hot, they drink more uh, because they go back and they evaporate the, that water and they cool the hive down with the evaporation as it gets too hot. So they'll be on your neighbor's pool or your neighbor's bird bath or just bugging your neighbor unless you have a water source for them close by. And they do need it. All right, so the idea, and I put these pictures in to show difference between perfect and what happens in reality you know sun or shade or both there isn't supposed to be any direct wind you're supposed to have space between the hives perfect height there's supposed to be a water source um, ease of access how do you defend against predators uh, the airport analogy is pretty interesting i don't know if you've ever flown out of cedar rapids but when you return to Cedar Rapids um, and you come from the east, just as you cross the Mississippi, the airplanes start descending so that by the time you get to Cedar Rapids, they're a thousand feet or something. But they've been descending from uh, western Illinois all the way here. It's a very gradual descent. You don't even notice it. Bees do the same thing if they, if they have the opportunity. So if you put your beehive and there's no obstructions and there's a long straight patch between the entrance here down here where they fly in and where they can come from they will fly on a flight path and slowly go in so you can walk in the yard and they will bump you they will hit you you can be 50 feet away and they'll be at your your shoulders because they're coming in at that level very, very. So if you want them to be steeper and come drop down, find a windbreak, give them sufficient distance, and they'll fly over the windbreak, and then they will, will dive down to the hive. Um, if it isn't a problem, then don't worry about it. Don't aim your hive at your neighbor's property, though, because they will do that on your neighbor's property where they will fly in across his yard at five feet above the ground and bump into him or his dogs or, or 
you know, his kids, and that doesn't create good neighbors. So that's why you want a windbreaker and you want to face the entrance in a different direction. Typically, you want to face the entrance towards sunlight, never to the west. Um, I'm sorry, never to the north. All right, I have this picture up here on the right to show you what these are pollinators up in North Dakota. And you can see they aren't worried about how close the hives are to each other. They aren't worried about water um, or height. They're just worried about pollination, so they just stick their hives anywhere like that. The bees do survive. Uh, this is over in Europe, uh, a beekeeper, and you can see here. And the reason you have colors, bees can tell difference in colors, and they can tell if you put designs on the front and different colors, they will come back pretty much to the same hive every time. But if all the hives look the same, they will go to a different hive with their nectar, and they will get cross-pollination between hives. So if one hive is sickly, then, then those bees will wind up in many hives. Bottom right is a good location here for hives. You can see they're off the ground. Uh, they have room to stand behind them. Um, seems a good setup. I don't know. There probably is water here. The upper left is not necessarily a good situation. Uh, first of all, on the front, that's not swarming. Um, <laughs> it just escapes me what it is. Uh, they congregate there when it's hot. Um, it's called bearding. And they beard on the front like that. I have some other pictures of bearding. And typically that's in late July, August when they do that. It gets too hot in the hive. They come out just to stay cool. The reason that isn't a good location as you notice, they're back up against the fence, and there's not much space between them. So this beekeeper can't really inspect the bees very well, obviously, because you'd have to stand in front of the hive. You never want to stand in front of the hive because those bees will be bumping into you constantly, and you'll be annoying them because they can't get to the entrance. You always want to stand behind the hive or to the side of the hive. I recommend to the side but either one of those works. Uh, this is for bears. Uh, we don't have that problem, but uh, if you have a lot of dogs or whatever, you may want to consider that. My dogs have learned, I have uh, had five dogs. Four of them would never go even close to the beehives. I had a puppy that thought it was really a lot of fun to go over there for a while. And then I saw her one day on her back, wiggling around like a worm, and uh, she's never gone back to the hives again. She gets stung too much. Uh, this is another a hive. It's nice. The entrance is there. The only problem I have with this is the height. And you can see it's getting pretty high. Uh, you're going to have to reach above your head to change these. These are probably all honey supers, the one on the top. Um, that's work. Uh, when you're stacking your hive up, and I get hives that are tall sometimes, but the higher they are, the harder they are to manage. Um, here, the hive on the right, I think is ideal. The one on the left is going to be really hard to get those honey supers off the top. Uh, if you want to inspect the lower brood boxes, and you do, will want to inspect them. But it's a pretty picture. And these are, again, in Europe. Um, you can see they just put them anywhere, and the bees do tolerate it. And this happens to be, I believe, in Germany or Switzerland. This is how they keep their bees there. Pretty interesting. Um, and these hives are all open from the back. They're in a they're in these uh, enclosures. Uh, the beekeeper works from behind, and the back of these beehives are uh, slide out, and that's how he inspects. They are inspected, uh, whether it's male or female beekeeper. Um, just interesting in different ways to keep bees. 
and here's what the pictures look. You can see they're fairly artistic. You can have your kids draw pictures on you behind mm -hmm. and paint them. Um, this is, uh, I've seen this in the United States and this is also in Europe where they move these hives around on trailers to where they're needed during blooming seasons. Um, that isn't the way the big guys do it. The big guys use payloaders uh, and semi-trucks and they have uh, all the bee hives on pallets. All right, so you know, inspecting a hive, you got to worry about nutrition and whether they have enough food. The brood, the food to the brood determines how healthy the bees are when they when they emerge. All right, and how how much resistance they have to disease. So the key is, if you have sick nurse bees, you'll they will make. Uh, they won't make good food necessarily. So you want to make sure your nurse bees are healthy and that's a whole mite issue, right? Disease issue. And then that will transfer into the brood and then your brood is, is healthy too. All right. Um, in the spring, if you feed protein patties, uh, a single type of protein patty won't be sufficient. You want them to get a diversity of food because of a diversity of pollen, because if they get a diversity of pollen, they'll make a diversity of food for the queen and worker jelly for the larva, and it'll be healthier. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's why um, you don't want to just feed protein patties in the spring. Uh, you want to wait until there's a, you want a good bloom. Um, and that's also why you don't want to just stick them in a soybean field. So all they do is get the soybean. Uh, pollen. You know, you want them to be able to get other pollen from the area. Uh, there are certain areas in Iowa where, you know, you can go miles and there won't be any trees or, or wild flowers or, or woods, just just beans and corn, and corn's useless for bees. Um, yeah, queens and nurse bees have to have protein. When they become foragers after uh, 20 days or so, they just eat honey. These were the hormones I was talking about before. There's a queen pheromone, there's a juvenile pheromone from young bees, there's a brood pheromone, and they all influence how a hive works. If there's no brood pheromone, then what happens is you don't need as many nurse bees. So the nurse bees become foragers a few days earlier to decrease the number of nurse bees because they don't have a job in the hive. Uh, if you don't have any juvenile fer pheromone, that means there aren't nurse bees, so the older foragers regress and start feeding uh, the uh, larva. Like I said, nurse bees lose their ability to make uh, this acid and royal jelly and become foragers eventually. Uh, but the foragers can make the food. It's just, just very inefficient. So this is pollen. Pollen's interesting. Every plant has a unique pollen and it's all categorized. You can look at honey under a microscope and people do analysis of it. And they can tell you what the honey um, types of plants were from the honey, whether it came from you know Asia, North America, South America, Iowa versus California. Um, they can tell you specifically what plants. Uh, one pound of honey is needed for every 4,000 bees that uh, are larva. Your typical hive over a year. Um, has about 60,000 bees in it at any time in the peak of the summer. And it, at rear, it the queen typically has around 200,000 eggs a year. So over a year's time, you need about 50 pounds of pollen in the winter, spring, and summer. So that's why when you're inspecting a hive and you're pulling frames out, 
you should look and you can determine, oh, there is pollen on a couple frames, that's good. Or I don't have any pollen, do I need to take some frames from a different hive and put them in there? A lot of management between two hives is frame management. Does this one not need, not have any honey or does this one not have any pollen or are they okay? And this is uh, when you do inspections on a hive. Um, it's never done until paperwork's done. You see this lady here filling paperwork out. The dog was filling paperwork out. So you're doing an inspection, you're gonna have a sheet to give you a memory jogger, and maybe you can write down some notes afterwards. But do you have all stages of the brood? You're looking for the eggs, you're looking for the larvae, you're looking for cat brood, and in certain quantities. And, and it's hard to always see eggs, but if you can, it's great. You don't have to find the queen. Um, if you can't find the queen, it's not a huge disaster if you have eggs or larvae. If you don't have any eggs, but you have larvae and you couldn't find the queen, check back and Instead of eight days, check back in four days and see if there's still larva or if there's eggs. Uh, because the larva will progress into cat brood, right? And if the queen isn't there, you won't have any eggs and you won't have any larva. And that will tell you that, gee, I had a queen problem, a queen incident, and I need a new queen. Uh, what stressors are around? Stressors can be people. People are stressors. Animals are stressors, mites are stressors, diseases are stressors. So you're thinking of that. Um, and of course, I keep emphasizing water is the most important thing that they need access to. Um, especially, um, you know, yeah, in the spring they can go get it from the grass or they can get it from a pond if they really have to. But if it gets to be a drought and it gets to be 90 or 100 degrees, they really do need water. What food do they have? And last, do they have enough space? If they don't have enough space, then they're, they're going to stay there. So that's why I say keep some records so that you can remember, gee, this is what the hive looked like three weeks ago, and this is some notes I had from two weeks ago. Just some memory joggers. Um, right now, if you wanted to inspect the colony, uh, you would just look at it and maybe look down between the frames and see if there's bees down there. And that'd be it because it's not warm enough. When it gets, and if you pull it out in this type of weather and it isn't in the, in, I'm going to say mid to upper 60s or so, you're going to chill the brood and it will kill the larva or kill the eggs. Um, because the brood always has to be about 95 degrees. So you need quick inspections. Later, when it gets to be in the 70s, you can you can pull them out and do a detailed inspection um, on each frame. I mentioned this before, but your inspections need to start, come up to the hive on the side and just watch, watch what the bees are doing. Are you getting a lot of bees in and out? That's a good sign. Are they bringing pollen in and out, or in at least? Um, and there should be a constant flow of bees in. If there aren't, uh, you need to look and see, is it because I don't have any foragers, but I got a lot of larvae and brood, so there are going to be a lot of foragers in, in a week or so. Are there any problems at the front of your hive? Uh, as you saw in my pictures where I have blue board wrapped around them, uh, I can tell you on my blue board over winter, uh, some animals had scratched or tried to eat through the blue, blue board on the front of the hives trying to get into them. Now I have mouse guards behind the blue board, so I'm not worried about them actually, mice or anything getting in, but they tried and they actually chewed the blue board. Where did you get that blue board? Oh, I got it at Lowe's. Uh, okay. They're just, you can use blue, there's a lot of different things you can use. I just have to make use what they call blue board. It's a foam insulation. Okay. They, okay. they sell, it's cheaper than buying, um, they, they actually sell um, insulating blankets and things for hives. Uh, it, I made my own with, with insulating.
play yeah. more. Um, all right. In the spring, you want to inspect at least every eight days. And I'm thinking May, at least May, at least in May and the first part of June, maybe uh, at the last week of April, but every eight days. Why? Is because when they leave, when they, if they're going to swarm, they will make swarm cells for a new queen. And every, on the ninth day after a swarm cell is made, they will cap that swarm cell, that queen cell. Once they cap it, that hive will swarm. But before they cap it, if you get them before all the cap, hive, before the swarm cells are capped, you can destroy those and then they'll have to start them over. All right, because they won't swarm if they don't have capped queen cells to leave the hive some queen eventually. Um, and then you can do inspections like every 10 to 14 days later on. Um, and that's hard to do. It doesn't sound hard to do, but it is if you have a few hives because it rains, uh, you have events to go to, uh, baseball games, whatever, you know, and all of a sudden you get wrapped up in real life and you go, oh, it's been a couple weeks before I looked at my hives. Um, Never stand in front of the hive, always on the side. If you have a smoker, which I recommend, put a few puffs of smoke in the front of the hive before you, before you open the hive. That sort of tells the guard bees something's going to happen. It makes them go eat more honey, so it calms the guard bees down a little bit. And the big thing is to be slow and smooth with all your actions. Uh, we use bee suits and bee gloves. Uh, and hats. Like I said, in Germany, all they wear is a veil. Uh, they aren't allowed to use gloves or suits because the beekeepers should know how to handle bees without getting stuck. That's part of their uh, test, their license. They actually get a license to be a beekeeper in Germany. Um, Sorry if you said this, but how do you know what a swarm cell looks like? Uh, I will have pictures of those eventually here. Okay. It's a queen, it's a queen cell. Queen cells are like long peanuts. Think of a peanut on the side, and whether it's capped or not is on the bottom of the peanut, whether it's sealed or whether it's open. So the way they make a queen is, is pretty unique. It's all food-based. So every fertilized egg could be a queen but they have to make this big cell and they have to stick it for royal jelly, which is high protein uh, with their enzyme. And they just pack it full of food and that larva eats that and just keeps eating the food and eating the food. And that makes it a queen. Uh, and it emerges in 16 days rather than 21. Um, and that's how it gets its um, ovarials to, to develop or ovarials develop because of all the food. So uh, queen is determined by how much food they feed her. Uh, like I said, you get a hive tool. Don't you don't borrow your hive tools to anybody else, or don't use them on anybody else's hive, because you don't know what diseases or what problems they have. And your hive tool will carry that. Just use your hive tool on your hives. The state um, apiarist carries, you know, he. He carries a tool and he goes to a lot of different hives. And what he does is he puts it in a smoker between hives to sterilize it so he doesn't move a disease from hive A to hive B. Uh, I don't do that on my hives. Um, I guess you could, but you know, he has, he goes he goes to many different apparatus, so he can he has a bigger chance of carrying these problems around with him. A rule is that every hive is always in trouble. A hive is never just okay. There's always a problem with a hive and you have to figure out what it is. So how do you feel when you look at a hive, how do you feel about it? Sometimes you feel, oh, this hive's pretty good, it's okay. All right, I can, I can live with that. But remember, it's probably on the verge of some type of problem and usually mites 
um, are usually the issue. You always have mites. So you're going to have these two brood chambers after you start your hive. In the when you have one brood chamber with your package, you can visualize this just as one. But eventually, you're going to have a second uh, frame above it or a third frame. If you look from the side, this is be how the brood brood will look. You notice the frames have a different amount of brood on them the closer it gets to the middle. You'll get most of the eggs uh, and larva and cat brood eventually in the middle, and it gets smaller and smaller as it goes to the outside edges. Except the outside frames will have the highest portion of drones. Um, they intuitively know to put drone cells on the outside of the of the brood area. If you look from, I think the next one here, if you look from the top, if you're looking down into the hive, the brood area will typically be centered and it'll be like a circular thing right in the middle or oval right in the middle of your hive. It doesn't extend all the way to the edges. So that affects how you're going to inspect the hive. Because when you inspect it, here's the top down view over here on the right, you're going to be taking the end frames out first every time. You always one or one or the other end. What that does is it gives you an inch, inch and a half of space to move so you don't be squishing bees all the time. Because the end, the very end frames here, 20 outside will most often, not always, but most often just have honey. Um, if it gets really crowded, you will get eggs and a cat brood over here. I've seen that. But let's say uh, typically you won't. Typically it'd be honey. So you pull these end frames out. You still do it gently so you don't get the bees all anxious with you. Uh, but you you're going to have thousands of bees moving around, and this gives you space to move these frames a little bit as you manipulate them so you aren't squishing bees all the time because you're going to be squishing bees. Okay, and this is what I say, classical brood frame. And if you see this, it's like, oh, perfect. You notice honey's on the outside edges, and that's nice honey, capped honey. You'll see pollen next to the cap brood. And this is all colored. The colored area here is pollen. And this is all cap brood, uh, which means it was eggs, went to larva, and now they put wax over the top. And in 21 days, the bees will emerge from that. And then they will clean it up and reuse it again. Uh, another picture of you notice there's no honey on or or um, pollen on the outside of this, but there is a lot of cat brood right here. And if you look over here real close on the right side, that's larva. I don't know if you can see it, but this little white in those cells, that's larva. So this is all cat brood that will be emerging bees in um, a few days. Again, my picture of what you need to look for for the egg. Larva with food. Um, this is good larva. You notice down here on the right, those are big, big larva, and they're getting ready to be capped. And these are all larva, very young larva. And that's another thing. You're looking at the larva, you can look and say, oh, it's old or it's young. Uh, you're, and you go, oh, this is sort of new larva, and oh, this is old larva. It's going to be capped pretty soon. And this is yellow uh, frame, plastic frame. I put that in there because you can hopefully see how difficult it is to see what's inside of it versus the black. Uh, I also put it in there because, uh, let me see if I can find it. This is a laying worker hive right here. 
right here. If you look, you can see two eggs in there. And you can see two eggs in this one here. Um, I think I have some other pictures where you can see two eggs easier. All right, when you see, you start to see two eggs. If it's a brand new queen, uh, you can excuse her for a day or two. These aren't, this wasn't a brand new queen. What this was, was a queenless hive that I didn't know any better. Remember, most of my experience comes from mistakes. And boy, have I made mistakes. I've had a lot of, a few queenless hives because I didn't check for eggs or larvae. I didn't know better. Um, I didn't realize it. And, you know, four weeks later, all of a sudden, my my worker bees are laying eggs. Um, right here is a picture of the two eggs in one cell. Um, two larvae appear in one cell. Uh, not good. You, If you get that, it's really difficult to save the hive. There's ways to save it <clears throat> if it hasn't gone too far. Most experienced beekeepers will just abandon it and let it go. Uh, I don't try different methods. I've never abandoned one. One theory was you could take uh, and drop your bees like 100 yards away and shake them all out and put your hive back together. And then the worker bees that were laying eggs would be too heavy to fly back to the hive. Well, that theory isn't, isn't accurate, but I've tried it. Um, um, there is a proven way is where you take plastic, just bare frame, bare uh, foundation, and you shake all your bees into this new hive, um, and that forces them to make a new hive, and and they don't they don't have a place to lay eggs. Uh, it works. It takes all summer to do that method. Another method, the one I use a lot, quite not, not a lot, but a few times, is I will <clears throat> replace larvae and eggs and cat brood into a, a, a hive that has a lane worker. And I will do that for several days, um, a week or so, to get the fair gnomes back. And then I will get a queen, a caged queen, and I'll put her in there, and I won't release her for a week or so. So then get the queen pheromone, and then I'll release her. That's worked a couple times for me. The best bet is to prevent it from happening. Um, this is a perfect frame. You probably can't tell. I didn't take that great a picture, but in some places you can. Every cell on this frame is this black plastic with with the wax comb that the bees built. Every cell has one egg in it. I don't know if you can see them, but there's one egg. In it. It's just like the perfect frame for eggs. She was a very busy queen that day and she laid eggs on this entire um, frame. Um, again, eggs stand up first day. They're tilted the third day. We don't want multiple eggs. Uh, if they've been queenless for three to four weeks, all of a sudden the worker bees will start laying eggs. That's why we're always looking for eggs or larvae. And that's why you're doing inspections more often than once a month. Um, trying to make sure you do have a queen. Um, the best part is she's laying 3,000 eggs a day. She can She can fill those frames pretty quickly. Um, so they need space for nectar, the foragers do, that's your honey supers up on top, and then she needs space for her eggs, and if they don't have that, they will start preparations to leave. Um, larva needs to be pearly white, never yellow, never brown, curved but not twisted, I'll have pictures of, of what happens if it looks twisted. Not dry. If it's dry, it means they're getting enough water or moisture or something. Uh, it's it's a problem, and there should be no noticeable smell. But the big thing is, you saw pictures of the pearly white substance on the larva. That's just perfect food. 
and I'm going to stop there until Thursday. Send me your emails, please. I will send you that inspection sheet and then send you some dates and times when we can make uh, make up for the things that you might have missed, if that's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye. Bye.